Today's Antiques Roadshow has come back to Nyman's in West Sussex, where the National Trust have been the proud custodians since 1953. These celebrated gardens are the work of many generations, while the ruined manor, which was the result of a tragic fire, adds a sense of Gothic romanticism. It's no surprise that this is one of the most visited gardens in the UK, but you might not know that it was the height of fashion during the Edwardian and interwar years. It was open frequently to the public during the 1920s and 1930s, and they came to see the treasure trove of rare, exotic plants. Being the first to have a rare breed in blossom gave the garden prestige, and Nyman's was one of the most admired in the country. The head gardener's son, Harold Coomber, introduced many of these plants. He was born at Nyman's, and the Messel family who lived here helped sponsor his plant hunting expeditions. Harold risked life and limb traveling to the far-flung corners of the expanding world in search of new botanical treasures. And in his journal of his Andes expedition, he talks about, as far as possible, finding a plant in new ground in all botanical senses of the word. Now, one of the plants he brought back was the Almastraria lictu, which is more commonly known as the Peruvian lily. And crucially, he found it at high altitude, which meant it could survive in a British climate. And this can now be found in pretty much any garden centre in the UK. In fact, I've got one in my own garden. The Peruvian lily, along with many of the plants behind me, are now thriving in British gardens, all because of Harold. It's the tireless efforts of Harold Coomber and others like him that turned British gardens into the riot of non-native species that they are today. And it makes a gorgeous backdrop for our visitors to today's Antiques Roadshow. So I suppose the first question is, what do you know about this lady? And the second would be, how did she um, manage to make her way into your family? I don't know very much about her at all. She's been in our family for 40 years. She's actually my mum's. She came into the family uh, because mum and dad were going out for a drink one evening to one of their favourite haunts in Chaley. And opposite the pub, there was a small antique shop. Dad went to get the drinks, mum went to have a look in the antique shop, and she went back into the pub proudly and very excitedly saying, look what I bought, look what I bought, and it was this lady. We think she's marble. Yep. We think she might be sort of 1920s, something like that, but okay. don't know any more than that. Right, OK, well, you're quite right when talking marble, because normally on the programme we, we get two types of medium. One is alabaster, mm -hmm. which is much softer, and generally it's not the premier material. Marble is, OK. There is a signature there, PH, Wolf is W-O-L-F-E-R-S. This man is, you know, he's a big noise in, and in this case, around about 1909, 1910. But let's have a look at the girl, right. okay? Okay. Your mother's adopted a girl who's of beautiful form. I do a lot with sculptures of nudes, whatever, and I look at it with a critical eye. I look at it from a sculptor's point of view. This is perfection. Um, in every sense of the word. Now, this particular model is referred to as ingenue, and she encapsulates the meaning of the word. She's, she's wholesome, she's innocent, and there is a sensuality about it. Whenever I look at a good bronze or a good uh, piece of sculpture, do you know what I look for? I look at the toenails. I really do, um, and they're beautifully carved in there. Can you see? Yes. So this is the mark of a master in every... Can you remember how much Mama paid for this way back then? I think it was about ninety pounds. Ninety pounds. That's quite a fair amount of spending money yeah. forty years ago. It was. Yeah, Dad wasn't overly impressed until he saw her, and then he liked her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now I've got to be perfectly candid with you because when it comes to valuation, um, I don't have a precedent. So I've got to go with something which is nothing more than gut reaction. So bearing in mind that th this is an important designer and sculptor. A great man. I would expect if I was to find one of these in an auction, probably somewhere in the West End of London, that it would carry a pre sale estimate of between five and eight thousand pounds. Oh. oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Good grief. She's oh. even more beautiful now. Oh. <laughs> I'm dying to know where you got these spoons from. 
Well, my mother very kindly gave them to me, and I think because my name is on the bowl there. I see. Uh, did she say where she got them from? Well, my father was in the silver business, and I grew up with them, so I really think we had them for a long time. Well, the reason why I'm dying to know where you got them from, and I'm not exaggerating, I think these are the finest Victorian spoons I have ever seen in my life. Really? <laughs> they are Wonderful. outstanding quality. Absolutely outstanding. They are cast with scenes from Shakespeare's plays. We've got Titania and Bottom from Midsummer Night's Dream, and we've got Miranda and Ferdinand from The Tempest. But what I particularly like is that the silver has been oxidized, and then the rest has, is gilded. Yeah. So the combination of the two gives this fantastic richness. Mm -hmm. Both are hallmarked, uh, and they have the date letter for 1891, but very frustratingly, they got a mark CC, and I've been looking at silver for 40 years plus, and I've never seen that mark. I don't think it's in any of the books on silver, so I can't actually tell you who made them. What a shame, because I looked it up on the internet and I couldn't find it either. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad we're on the same uh, level there. Um, if I tell you that most Victorian spoons, decorative Victorian spoons, are worth probably at the most for a pair about 150 pounds. These are so good. I'm going to stick my neck out and say I think they're worth at least a thousand pounds. That's lovely. Thank you very much. And I would love to walk off with them now. <laughs> no chance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You made my day. Now I have to tell you now that we're looking at an almost worthless piece of jewellery. Of course, on the show, we often see sparkly pieces with diamonds made of gold. But the very reason we can stand here and talk about this is because it's a worthless thing. Can you take us back to the beginning of the story of this remarkable piece? Sure. Well, Ludwig Messel, who founded the garden here at Nyman's and who was my great-great-grandfather, he and the rest of the family came over from Germany to England in the 1860s, 1870s. OK. And the other half of the family stayed in Germany. So the idea of the bracelet was this is the, the plaited hair of three of the daughters of his sister Lena, who was sent back to the grandmother, still living in Germany, and passed down right. through the German side of the family. So, of course, they were a, a German-Jewish family, and that meant during the 1930s they were at risk of being persecuted by the Nazis, and, and they fled Germany just before the Second World War with help Gosh. from their cousins here. Yeah, oh, how remarkable. And, of course, they were able to bring this bracelet with them because it isn't made from gold or any precious stones, because otherwise, no doubt, the German authorities would have seized it for their own sort of wealth and coffers. Now, often, plaited hair taken from loved ones was used for very sad purposes, often for mourning. But in this particular case, it's the very opposite, because there's the remnants, literally it's a remnant of each of those little girls, their hair. It's a symbol of love. And the girls' names are engraved on the inside. If I just pick up the bracelet, which is a silvered base metal, there's simply a grey metal showing through. And the three names, uh, Matilda, Louise and Edith. That's right. It, it, it's such a poignant thing. Now, I'll be honest, if it didn't have the story and this piece was to turn up at auction, it may only be worth 50, 100 pounds maximum, but it's worth so much more with its story and its provenance, which is remarkable. Well, in a way, as you say, it's only because it has no monetary value that it survived, and that's why it's important to us. When I wear jewellery, I like it to reflect my personality. Right. This jewel must reflect your personality. No, not mine at all. <laughs> but it no? definitely reflects the woman I inherited it from. Completely. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. That is interesting because it is so bold and yes. sumptuous and structural and, and it's screaming out individuality here. Yes. So who was, who was the person? So the person was a dear friend of the family and she was a very, very wealthy Parisian woman from the Rothschild family. 
and she was an old friend of my grandmother's and she was a wonderful, very theatrical, she lived a, a very luxurious life in this beautiful apartment in Paris that we would visit. And yes, it fits her perfectly. It's stunning, it, it's very striking. But also what is interesting is that when I turned it over, we can see that on the back it's got Seaman Sheps. Now, Seaman Sheps, I don't think we've actually had on the Antiques Roadshow oh, right. before. Oh, excellent. So this is a first. Yeah. And Simon Sheps was born in New York, and he was a traveling salesman, and he had a shop in New York. But the Wall Street crash of 1929, uh, he lost everything. So he had to rethink. And he went off on a world trip, and he went to Asia, and he loved Hong Kong. All the, all the colors and all the magical uh, qualities of their Object yeah, dark. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so when he came back to New York, he then developed this whole new style. And he's used these wonderful, sumptuous jewels. They're not necessarily the best quality mm. at all, mm. but it is the way that he's put them all together. Yeah. You've got all you know, the cabochon rubies, cabochon sapphires. You've got these wonderful bulbous emeralds, which I just think are... are don't, these are emeralds? They're emeralds. Are you serious? Huh. <laughs> I thought it was jade or something. I don't... Oh, really? I, I'm not, I don't know much about jewellery. So. Oh, my gosh. No, they are emeralds. They're huge emeralds. Yeah, they're all huge. Yeah. They are. They're so, and it's, and I just love the way. Are you liking it now, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I still might not wear it. But. Well, I'm not sure about that. I think it will look beautiful on you. <laughs> so that is very typical of the 40s. They used diamonds just to, just to highlight the design. Uh -huh. It wasn't about the diamonds. Right. It was about the look. Right. And so this was such a wonderful look in the 40s, and that has continued on to this day. It is still, Seaman Sheps is still in business right. to this day. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. But this is one of the originals. Really? You think it's from the 40s? I think it's a little bit later, probably like 50s. Uh -huh. I think uh -huh. it's in the 50s. Uh -huh. I think it's a wonderful jewel. Uh -huh. And at auction, I would say that you would, you'd be looking in the region of about eight to ten thousand pounds <laughs> really oh my goodness wow oh my goodness okay <laughs> huh that's nice <laughs> oh you're saying that lovingly oh, yeah, well, you know, but, now, but now after the story it just makes me wonder whether i should yeah i mean i was determined to sell it but then i just didn't get around to it but i don't know yeah before it's... you think about selling it will you promise me that you'll wear it a few times and then decide Okay. Is that a deal? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. A simple little bowl, a comic little bird, but on the reverse, something that makes any antique specialist's heart flutter. That word, Picasso. How do you come to own it? Well, it actually belongs to my parents, and they were given it as a gift from some friends of theirs who were neighbours of Picasso in the south of France and they bought it from his studio and my father was a big cigar smoker and he used to use it to stub out all of his, his cigars. Uh, did your father stop smoking? Mm, eventually, yes. Well, that's one thing. The little dish that he used to nub out his cigars into. Today, 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. Okay. You promise me you won't use it for national? No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> definitely well. not. Well, here we are in the beautiful walled flower garden at Nyman's. I'm looking at a lovely picture of Dahlia's. And it's painted by an artist that's perhaps more synonymous with sculpture. And it's a Jacob Epstein. Yeah. How long have you had this? About 10 years. 10 years. And where did it come from? Um, I inherited it from an uncle, a very, very dear uncle, a very eccentric uncle, who loved his pictures and didn't really love very much else, <laughs> and lived in a flat which was very threadbare in all respects, but had beautiful paintings on the walls. He sounds like my sort of man, it's a bit like me, because you, if you're into pictures, you collect them. And this is a beautiful example of a late Epstein. It's quite abstract, it's quite broadly painted, isn't it? Which is very typical of him. I can imagine just painting this really quickly, but you stand back and they're, they're definitely dahlias. And they're painted with watercolor, and I think it's a mixture of watercolor, 
body colour and gouache. You can see there on the yellow, the heightened yellow there, and that's the body colour. And it gives that sort of almost 3D effect. Epstein is really interesting. He, he was an American, born in the States, went over to Paris and studied at the Academy Julien, came over to this country in the early 1900s, and he was a very avant-garde sculptor. In 1913, he did a very amazing sculpture called Rock Drill, which is very futurist. It's the most amazing thing to see. Later on, he went to doing bronzes of heads and hands. That's what he became famous for doing. But then he did watercolours and gouaches like this. Now, on the back, I see there are labels, and it's come from the Leicester Gallery in 1942, okay. which is a fantastic provenance, because they were such a good gallery, and they sold all the top artists, and he was one of their artists. Okay. I've seen a few of these flower studies in my time. This is a very good one. And they were painted towards the end of his life in the 1940s and 50s. He died in the 1950s. So you're a very lucky lady to have this, because it's got lovely provenance on the back, it's a really bright, lovely subject by him. And then what's it going to be worth? I would say four to six thousand pounds. How yeah. fantastic. Go, Uncle Mike. <laughs> <laughs> now, I could have a bit of fun with you here. We could start talking about kind of unlocking uh, all the facts uh, and, and the keys and clues about this collection. But I'm going to have to be a bit more serious than that because this is an incredible collection of keys. I don't think I've ever been confronted with a collection like this. Before we start, I need to know how someone amasses such a collection. Uh, forgive me for saying this, but you look quite young. Um, yes. What got you started? Um, everything started from these keys, which my grandfather gave me when I was a child. Right. And I felt that I wanted to start a collection, so this is how I started. Just so that key there key, is the yes. starting point yes. for all of this. Yes. Right. What do you know about that key? I know that it's a Venetian key, yeah. Italian, originally from Italy. Right. And it's from uh, 15th century. Right, okay. So I know there were quite ornate keys and they were using for cabinets or doors. Yes. They're yeah. quite um, distinctive from these yeah. letters yeah. on the bow. Well, you've got an incredible selection here. They vary in size and use enormously for the kinds of things that they were made for. And I can see that, in fact, you've got some really uh, amazing sort of 14th, 15th century keys here. And you've also got some incredible keys at the front there. That big Gothic monster at the front there, yes. which is, what, 15th, 16th century? Yes. They really, really like that. Where do you buy them? Where do you come across them? I started to buy from car book sales. Yeah. And then when I was going through the process of buying, I started to realise I need to buy more selected items. Right. So I started to approach auction house and private seller right, on okay. online website. And right, OK. There's a lot more to keys than the fact that they unlock things as well. There's a lot of myth associated with keys. Uh, and one thing I like is the symbolism within a key as well. We'll see within this collection that there are lots of religious keys, for instance. So the symbolism within the bow, that's the section at the top, because, of course, there are three parts to a key. There's the bow, there's the shank, and there's that little bit at the end, which is called the bit. The bit, absolutely. So it was thought in the medieval period, for instance, that a church key could cure illness for instance. So it would be put in water and then the water would be then given to infants who were ill. So many of these keys have much bigger stories behind them and yes. that's what I really, really love. I tell you, one of my favourite, uh, which is a little bit naughty, is if apparently you're trying to conceive and you put a key in the bed, that kind of unlocks the kind of the fertility issue. Um, that's a great medieval one as well. Um, it's a really difficult one to kind of nail down when it comes to value. How many keys in, in, in all? Nearly 1,000. Nearly 1,000 yeah. keys. Yeah. OK, well, I'm going to try and give you an overall value of what is here today. You know, I can see a wonderful stiletto key there, concealed stiletto key, which is probably a, a lovely 18th century key. You know, you're going to pay several hundred pounds for a key like that alone, particularly the ornate ones. The medieval key is not as expensive as, as people think. You can often buy a good late medieval key for £100 or so. Um, and I reckon that probably sitting in front of me here, you would be looking at probably in the region of about £20,000. <laughs> so I think it's a really, really great collection. It has been lovely to unlock some of the mysteries behind <laughs> it. Um, but I hope you have a great deal more fun collecting. Yeah, I will still collect for many, many years. Thank you very future, much. Yeah. So tell me the story of this uh, locked Regency binding. Well, about 25 years ago, my father asked me to help him try and unlock uh, this. Well, he, uh, bought, he bought it? At... He bought it, I think, in Liverpool and asked me to try and help him unlock it, and I couldn't. And he said, well, I'll give it to you, and then maybe one day you'll be able to unlock it. 
So I took it to a locksmith not many years later and undid it, and that's when I discovered... Well, undid it. it. They, they, they've actually broken the yes. lock. They've just taken it off like this. Mm. But it unfolds, it unfolds. And it, it looks as though it's a writing set, doesn't it? Yes, yes. And here it is, beautifully, beautifully preserved inside. And here we have all the stylos, stylos uh, bone handle stylos, and then this thing here that calls it um, a stylographic manifold writer. And the chap who made this is a chap called Ralph Wedgwood. Yes. Mm. Now, Ralph Wedgwood was the man who actually invented carbon paper as we know it today. Not that we use carbon paper today, but he was the man who invented it and patented it in uh, 1806. And this is a travelling companion mm -hmm. for somebody who wants to duplicate letters and all that sort of thing. And then I can see that there's instructions, there's all sorts of instructions about how to do it, how to sandwich your pieces of paper. It sounds awfully sticky and messy. And messy, yes. And <laughs> sticky and messy. And it's in this wonderful case. Yes, it looks quite glamorous, I think. It's incredibly glamorous. And you know, this is a Regency period. I mean, the date on this, I can see, there's a date here of uh, 1818. So this is, you know, right smack in the sort of that period. And the binder um, has got this wonderful binding. And look, if I just turn this over here, that has been protected from the dust. There's no dust on that at all. And that is what we call a cathedral binding. Oh, I see you. A cathedral yeah. binding. I, I'm sure you're going to ask me why it's a cathedral binding. Yes. It's because of these little rose windows here, round the edge. Now, I've never seen one in this sort of condition. One often sees these in sort of horrible condition. But the fact that it's been locked up for all those years, and you know. only, <laughs> only 20 years ago you yes. opened it yes. to find yes. this, I think is, is very, very exciting. It's, it's a very important piece. And I would have to value that at £5,000. Oh, wow, gosh. <laughs> Simply, it was a wonderful time. Elegance um, and all that sort of thing. Invention, industrial revolution. It is all encapsulated in this wonderful thing. Yes. Thank wonderful. you so much for Thank bringing it in. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's delightful. I recognise this face. Please, sir, can I have some more? It's the face of Oliver. It is. And he is related to you? He's my father. John Howe Davies, so he was in Oliver Twist as Oliver, and he was also in The Rocking Horse Winner and Tom Brown School Days as Tom Brown. And these were such iconic black and white movies, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, they were. And he's such an angelic little face as yeah, well. Yeah, it was. But we're also surrounded by other items connected with the BBC yeah. and another part of your father's life. Yes. So he started out as a child actor and went on to become the king of comedy. He did, British comedy, yeah. So tell me about that. So he joined the BBC as a production assistant and then very quickly moved up to being a producer. And he decided acting was not for him. Then. Yeah, he thought he was a terrible actor. He always said he didn't have the face for acting, he wasn't a good actor. I mean, obviously he was, but he didn't believe he was. Um, and then he went on to produce and direct comedies like The Towers, The Good Life. But he started his career by giving um, a group of young sort of actors a chance with their sort of comic stream of consciousness, which was Monty Python. He commissioned Blackadder, Only Fools and Horses, Not the Nine O'Clock News. So it was a roll call of the greats. Yes. Yeah. And we've got here a, a BBC record, Fawlty Towers BBC record. Yeah. And oh, this is one of my favourites, Mrs Richards. Yes, the deaf lady. The deaf lady. I can't hear yeah. you. Yeah, And then she funny. turned her hands, hearing it up yeah. and up and yeah. up, and finally... Too loud. John Cleese shouted yeah. up and nearly deafened her. Yeah. I think when my dad was sent the script to uh, Forty Towers, apparently he fell out of bed laughing. It was obviously it was how that good, good it was. Yeah. And how involved was he in, in how Forty Towers ended up on the television? Very involved. So he cast Prunella Scales. He, it was his idea to change the sign every time that the episode aired, so he was always mis mixing up all the words. Um, it was his idea to slap Manuel on the head with a <laughs> spoon. So he liked all that kind of violent comedy. He thought it was very funny. And as a child, he was involved with these people, working with them day in, day out. I yeah. mean, you must have had some extraordinary visitors in your home. Well, we did, yeah. Paul Eddington, who played Jerry in The Good Life is My Godfather. Um, Rowan Atkinson was a very good friend of my dad's, Richard Blyers, Penelope Keith. So they were always kind of in our home. It seemed quite normal to me. They're just very normal, lovely people, really. This is a picture of the cast of The Good Life. And this is your dad, That's then. my dad. Yeah. I mean, if, you, if you're going to think about the history of British comedy, mm -hmm. your father, as evidenced by, and this is just a small fraction, I know, yes. of, of the memorabilia you have connected with him, he sums up and represents the best that yeah, we've Yeah, we're had. very proud. And it's lovely now, because obviously he's not alive anymore, but my children watch his comedies. If we ever miss him, you know, he comes on the television sometimes, it makes me laugh, so we're really lucky to have that kind of, that lasting legacy of him, really.
specialists, as in all specialists at the roadshow, we get incredibly excited about things in boxes. So should we open it and find okay. out what's yes. in it? Very excited. So we've got this wonderful clock, but it, I must say it looks a bit like a dustbin with the dome top and the, and the flap here. A smart dustbin, yes. Um, it was presented to my grandfather in 1958 for services to a company. He was editor to a magazine for 67 years, and this was given to him by the directors and shareholders of that company in recognition of that long service. It's an unlikely thing for him to have chosen because he was a very Victorian gentleman and uh, we as grandchildren were only allowed to go into his study on occasions to greet him and uh, he would sort of tell us that you're growing up and how you're doing at school and then we were wheeled out. I think Victorian or not he chose really well because I joked about the dustbin because it is absolutely fabulous and anyone that knows anything we can see on the front, it's made by a company called Patek Philippe, who are synonymous with excellence in horology and watchmaking. And this clock from the 1950s, 1960s, was the, a solar-powered clock. So it was mm -hmm. designed to run from the sun with this solar cell that winds a rechargeable battery, a rechargeable cell, and runs the clock. On the outside, you've got this wonderful dome top and beautiful engraved scenes of, uh, looks like hunting scenes. So. I think your grandfather must have done very well for the company because if this was to come up into auction now, they generally command within around seven to ten thousand pounds. Really? It's an exciting item. I'm really glad you brought it in to show us. It's something that we don't see a lot of, so thank you very much. Well, thank you, but uh, it will remain in the family. That's good news. <laughs> Pleasure. Sorry, good. a very complicated monogram of VR in rubies and diamonds on a very plain locket, which hinted at very exalted provenance, but tell me about it with you. The locket belonged to my mother-in-law when I first came across it, and I kept saying to her how lovely it was and how beautiful it was and why didn't you wear it more often? And she said to me one day, well, if you like it so much, you better have it. And then I wore it for a while, and then I thought I would leave it to Sarah, my goddaughter. I thought I'd give it to her before I die, and she can enjoy wearing it, and I can enjoy seeing her wear mm. it. Lovely. And you do wear it? I do, yes. Oh, well, that's marvellous. And shall we ought to find out who wore it in the first place, I suppose, shouldn't we? Yes. And there's plenty of evidence, because VR on the front, perhaps no prizes for guessing who that is, and certainly not when we open it up, because there is Her Majesty herself. Mm. And typically of Queen Victoria and her jewellery. She likes to emphasise the provenance of it. And it says to Lady Victoria Campbell on her marriage, January the 24th, 1866, from her godmother, Victoria R, Victoria Regina, Victoria Queen, later Empress of India, and arguably the most important person living in the world at that time. And this is something from her hand. It's pretty yes. magic stuff, isn't it? And do you I feel that? She touched it herself. Oh, she didn't most... just send a menial out to go shopping. I think that there's it. absolutely every chance that she touched it. And I'm glad you said that because, in a funny way, these royal gifts are to do with the royal touch. The royal touch was oh. hugely important um, in antiquity. And we can say here there's another um, mm. set. It says a gold locket, ruby and diamonds, monogram given by Queen Victoria to Lady Victoria Lampton on her marriage. So that's another noble family, the Lampton family. Yes. So thrilling stuff, thrilling to me, thrilling to you. You. and now we've got to try and establish what sort of value to put on it and it's enormously difficult but I think I'm just going to blurt out £8,000. Oh my God. Well, I think I'll have it back. <laughs> no, you can't have it back. <laughs> well, I'll lend it to you. No, 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 no. It's yours. I changed your mind. Yes, it's yours. When I first saw this chair coming in, I thought it was ivory, you know, being this colour but obviously it isn't. So what can you tell me about it? It's a chair that was in our house as we grew up. I always remember it being there when I was a very tiny child. I used to think it was a, some kind of throne. Um, and uh, when I asked my dad about it, he said it was in the house when they moved into it, along with four others that were dark in colour. And the, the other four chairs, they're exactly the same with the little birds on the top? I believe they were. I never saw them. They were sold soon after. The expert at the time said, oh, you know, they're not worth a great deal of money because they're reproductions and this work is plaster rather than carving. OK. Well, 
on the positive side, it is all carved wood. It's not plaster. And when you look hard, you can see this black coming through, which could be carved coromandel wood. It's difficult to tell. This style of chair dates from the 17th century. Is this a 17th century chair or is this a 19th century chair? <laughs> In my opinion, it's a 17th century chair. So it's the real thing, which is, okay. I think, great news. Because these chairs were brought over by the Dutch East India Company. So they were made in Asia, and they're what we call a low chair. Mm -hmm. And this is made around 1680. And if, uh, if I lift the seat here, we can see, obviously, somebody's put this in, and this would have had a rattan yeah. base. I like it. I like it. And if we take care of it and... Some, well, what, some what needs to be done to it, it needs to be lovingly restored, um, glued up and have the rattan put back yeah. and just gently cleaned. That's it. Okay. In this condition, it's worth between 1500 and £2,000. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Pleasure. So commerce always leads design and this was one of the first portable radios designed 1948 by the Pi company. It's M78. Prior to this, you would have had your radios in the corner of a room, in a mahogany cabinet, legs like snooker tables, and suddenly you can go out for your picnic with your radio, just like we do with our MP3 players today. So, is it something that you've had for a while? I've had it since about 1982. Um, I bought it in a jumble sale for 10p when I was a student in Hatfield. Okay. And um, it just has travelled the country with me when I've moved from place to place and now lives on a shelf in my house in Brighton. Have you ever had it working? Uh, no, because it takes a 40, 40 or 50 volt battery or something. Yeah, something yeah. that I couldn't get hold of at the time, so yeah. it's just ornamental. It looks a bit kitsch on the first mm. look of it. It's, this colour is Oudinil. Not quite my colour, but I quite like it all the same. Mm. And um, there's a bit of controversy around this radio because being made in 1948, when it hit the streets, this was the time just post-war. Mm. But when those veterans of the Japanese war and the Burma's war come back to this country in 1948, they then found a radio with the sunburst almost relevant to the Japanese flag. Yeah. And there was outrage all over the country. There was uh, protests, demonstrations. They made yeah. a thousand of these and 800 of them were recalled put on a bonfire in Cambridge, set on fire, wow. in big protest. So for that reason, it's quite rare. It's got a rarity value. Mm. Have you any idea of the price? 10p. 10p? <laughs> I can give you 10p all day long for it. But because there was only 200 in existence, I think that they would be worth 1,000 to 1,500 pounds, which looks okay. a bit kitsch. <laughs> That's a so big surprise, yeah. I think you've done quite well. Thank you for bringing it along. Thank you very much indeed. You brought along this strange little creature. What have we got? It's a tortoise, and we got it at a Christmas fete. Did um, you? Yeah, to give to my granny. But when we, because uh, it was a really dirty bronze when we got it, so it was only one pound fifty. One pound fifty. Yes. <laughs> wow. Uh, so we cleaned it up, and then we saw the marks there, and we uh -huh. thought it might be expensive, so we didn't give it to granny. We kept it. You didn't give it to granny. <laughs> Poor granny. So what do you think it might be made from? Silver. Absolutely right, silver. you're going to get a job on the show. <laughs> so, what attracted you to the tortoise? Everyone likes tortoise. You like tortoise? Well, it was Charlie who got it. He must have thought it was nice because of the bell. I was going to say it does something else. Yeah. <laughs> You've got exactly that. So it's not just a silver tortoise, it's a bell. Yeah. So, if you ring that bell, does Charlie come running to help you? No. No? <laughs> because the original idea would be you'd ring the bell and someone would either bring you a drink or it could be at an entrance hall on someone's desk. Yeah, well, Mummy got um, too annoyed with us ringing it all the time, so she put it in the safe. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, you saw the silver marks, and I can tell you it is definitely silver, and it's made by a firm called Green & Company, who specialised in making novelty silver items just like this. Now, what did you say you paid for it? £1.50. What do you think it might be worth? Uh, have a go, have a guess. 80 Add on a zero. Mix. 800. Now you're getting warm. 800 to 1,000. Oh. So, Granny, what's she going to think? <laughs> she did so, get a bell, but not that She bell. did get a bell. <laughs> oh, so you gave her a different bell, but not quite yeah. a silver tortoise bell. Oh, well. 
and I'm so glad that you brought it along. I'm so glad that you kept it, and I'm so glad that we've, you've shared it with everyone today. Well done. Now, what's a harmless lady like you coming to the road show with a gruesome man trap? Well, it's been in the family, I would think, about 75 to 80 years. Um, right. My father-in-law was a builder. They were repairing the uh, roof of a bungalow. Of a bungalow? And it was on top of the bungalow. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> it is an iron man trap from the days when poaching was so prolific that landowners thought that they could set these huge jaws on a little latch. But, of course, it could catch man or animal in the most gruesome way. It was banned in about 1826 or 1830, that sort of period. But, you know, there are collectors for these things around, and I think it's worth around a thousand pounds. Yes, it is. <laughs> this box and I saw the word spinel there, my heart leapt with joy. But what I want to ask you is, if that word had not been there, would you have known what it was? No, probably not. When were you given it? I was given it to, uh, for my 40th birthday by my father and it had been in his possession for quite some time because my mother died in 64 when I was 12 and I know she wore it so it probably came from either a relative or maybe a friend, and my father thought that it'd be nice for me to have it because he was burgled in 73, just after I got married. My mother's jewel case, which had her wedding ring in and the pearls, they were stolen. And um, he put that in a plastic bag in the eaves. Well, I'm so pleased I didn't get hold of so this. <laughs> it's very wearable. Um, I have Good. I'm pleased you're saying that. It is a stunning spinel. Now, not many people have heard of spinels. And in fact, it wasn't until about 1793 when you could tell the difference between a spinel and a ruby. They sometimes call these ballast rubies because of the mines where they came from, which is in Tajikistan and Afghanistan on the borders. And that's where I think this has originally come from. Really? Can you imagine the journey that has taken hundreds of years ago, probably, along the silk trading route to Europe? And they would have thought that this was a ruby because it was red. And the famous spinels, like the Timor ruby in Buckingham Palace, is a spinel. So it has a wonderful heritage and history, these stones. But the popularity of spinels have, has really increased in the last few years. Just only a couple of years ago, a 50 character, now this is around about 10 carats, a 50 character called the Hope Spinel went for nearly a million pounds. <laughs> that, that, is five, <laughs> that, is, that is five times the size of yours. Um, but nevertheless, that really has put spinels on the map. This has been set in platinum, um, in an Edwardian mount, beautifully uh, set with all these small diamonds around the side here. And it's in this mallet box, which would have been retailed by, by mallet. Because um, you know, spinels are becoming so sought after, uh, in the right auction, I would say this is going to be in the region of about 15 to 20,000 pounds. Really? Ah. <laughs> No, I had no idea it was test that much. And it's so wearable. Oh, and it's so wearable. <laughs> what, what's what's it like? <laughs> a few years ago on the roadshow, the Fiona moment was most seen, most wanted. And Fiona invited us to nominate the things, one, that we saw most often on the roadshow, and two, the thing that you would love to see if it ever brought in to you. And you've done it. You've brought in, years after the event, you've brought in Most Wanted. Oh, so first off, thank you very much for bringing it. This is true English 17th century glass. At 350 years old, Charles II was on the throne of England when this glass was made. And, uh, wow. So where does it fit in your life? Well, I, I just think it's a fabulous piece of glass. Oh, it is. Um, You've only got to look at it and see the design and the influences, which are interesting, if you like, from, from that period of time. Does this look like a piece of English glass? Well, 
No, because really? it's stolen really out of the Venetian tradition. Before 1700, we didn't have a glassmaking identity. Yeah. We, we copied what the others were doing because we'd never made any of our own before, basically, right. sort of. But with the birth of lead crystal, 1676, George Ravenscroft, we start developing our own glassmaking identity. So here we have, as you suggest, we have the chain decoration out here and pinched uh, nipped diamonds, as they're called, pulled together with this trailing, very Venetian. I mean, it's important to note that somebody has taken a bite out of this. I know. Um, it wasn't me. <laughs> I mean, God, imagine actually oh. doing that to one's own glass. So presumably you bought it yeah. in this condition. Yeah, yes, yes. So, come on, you've got to tell me how much you well, paid for it. 1,300. 1,300 quid. Yeah. Well, how many do you think there would be in the world? 100? 200? Maybe? At most. Perhaps. At most? Yeah. No, this is ferociously rare. People talk about 17th century glass like it's common. 17th century English glass is as rarer than one could possibly imagine. This is you know, probably the, the rarest glass I have ever handled on the show. Oh. And you've paid 1,300 quid. Well, I think you've paid sort of the going rate. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, it's, just a, it's just such a privilege to be able to handle it and share it with people. Yes. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you well, very much indeed. Well, thank you. When I look at this, it strikes me as a particularly poignant testament to the horrors of the First World War. Tell me about it. It belongs to my husband's grandfather, and he was friends with the man who carved it. They were both on the Mons in the First World War, and they were both injured and hospitalised. And the man that carved this, we believe, was quite badly injured and spent the next two years carving this, calling it the tomb, in memory of his fallen comrades in the war. It was taken from one of the duck boards that used to, I think, prop the trenches. It's a real piece of trench art. Yes, with, it is. With yeah. the wood from the trenches yeah. themselves. So you have the soldier lying on top, yes. this prone figure. Yeah. Dead figure, is, is what lying, you look at it. Sort of lying in like, um, And then we've got the helmets all around it. And then... The date's here, 1914 yeah. at this end, yes. 1918 yeah. at the other. Yeah. And what can we see here? Tell me about this These here. are the, uh, we believe, the rifles standing in the trenches with the soldiers' helmets on the top. It's beautifully done, It is it? beautifully done. It's a very dark piece of trench art, I think, but beautiful for all that. And who knows, it may have saved him from going out of his mind, really, with perhaps as a piece of therapy or whatever, but it was certainly something to be very proud of. And it's very beautiful. And I'm, I'm thrilled to see it, I must Thank say. You. That poignant piece is a vivid example of the impact of the conflict on just one soldier. To coincide with the centenary of the end of the First World War, we're preparing to make a special program in which we look at the legacy of the war and how it affected not just those on the front line, but also family life, industry, art and literature. If you have a story, please contact us at antiques.roadshow at bbc.co.uk So here is what we've got to say is a humble farm animal made heroic by a very clever painter. I mean, look at the way she stands. She is queen of all she surveys. And yet, not an absolute monarch. You feel that she is a philosopher monarch. She's staring out to sea with a, that rather sort of distracted air of a thinker. It, it is a very clever picture from the way it's constructed, from the character of the beast, which you think you can read very clearly, to the textures of her hide and the light on her horns. It's a marvellous thing. And what's it doing in your house? Well, my father bought it. He was a dairy farmer, and this is a Frisian cow, and um, that's why, what attracted him to it, I think. When? Well, I should think in the 60s. That would make it a pretty well 100 years after it was painted, because if you look down there, it's dated 1864. Right. And do you know who it's by? No, I don't. Because I do. Ha! Oh, good. <laughs> Luckily for me, he's left his initials between the date there. Yeah. R.A. Yeah. Richard Ansdell. Richard Ansdell. Ansdell. Yeah. Now, he was very, very famous in his time. Uh, he was almost the landseer of his day. Uh, but like Landseer, he loved animals of all kinds, and he painted them again and again in different scale, different places. And here, he's treated the cow. Now, a cow was, uh, was not what you might call 
the most obvious of Victorian pictures, but he, that really is a very regal cow, don't you think? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I just think it's just superbly painted, and I love this detail in the foreground that just adds a little colour, draws the eye to this discarded clothing, this broken basket, and the incidental life of the sea behind, the fishing fleet becalmed. It all adds to the, the success of the picture. It isn't only about a cow. It's a very, very pleasing composition. Presumably, if you didn't know who it was by, you don't know what it's worth. No, I don't. OK. Well, he's quite a sought-after artist. Um, it's got to be worth 15 or £20,000. Please. It's a wonderful thing. Well, that's amazing. <laughs> Well, as an enthusiastic mountain biker, I just couldn't believe it when I saw you wheeling this fantastic bone shaker bicycle in. Give us a little bit of the background story. Well, my late husband, Christopher, was researching some damaged forks he picked up at a breaker's yard, and there was TIM. And so he went to London and researched the manufacturer, and it turned out to be Thomas Timberlake of Maidenhead. Oh. So after a little while, we got in touch with Thomas, the grandson of the maker of this bike. Really? And they, they really hit it off. They love bicycles. And then when the grandson died, the widow rang and asked if we would like this wonderful How machine. amazing, because yes. of your passion yes. and understanding of these yes. early bikes. How wonderful. Do you remember your husband ever riding it? Oh, yes. Really? He used to ride it Christmas morning down to see his parents. Christmas morning. Christmas morning. To see his and he used to wonderful. put his legs over there. Well, exactly. And off he'd and off he, you know, off down he any hill, he would be off Fantastic. <laughs> and away. Well, the idea of a basically a hobby horse but with pedals was that of a Frenchman, mm -hmm. Michaud, in the late 1860s. So. Fascinatingly, this one, which we can date to circa 1868, just fits perfectly. And they weren't called bone shakers for nothing because there's basically no suspension. The later leather seat sits on the only little token comfort, a huge spring, which will indeed absorb some impact. Mm -hmm. But basically, up through here comes all the friction, mm -hmm. and that's why it's called a bone shaker. Because as you went along on these iron rimmed, wooden spoked mm. wheels mm. You, you felt every mm. bump <laughs> but you know your only token stopping device is this little lever mm -hmm. with a wooden pad on it operated by the twist mm. of, of the handlebar mm. and it's interesting early cars early motorbikes they're just the preserve of millionaire collectors bikes They've been a little bit neglected. Mm, okay. I think its value is the price of a good modern mountain bike. It's worth about five thousand pounds. Good heavens! Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. My favourite period of English silver is the 17th century, and you brought along a charming little box with a portrait of Charles I on the top. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Yep. And before we have a look at it, what can you tell me about its past? Well, I know very little about it, Alistair, other than the fact that I was in business and one of the people in my office came to me and said he was a bit short of cash. And was I interested in this? And as I was actually in the insurance business, specialising in antiques, jewellery and bullion, uh -huh. I said, yes, I, I don't know anything about it, but it looks very interesting. Uh, what do you want for it? So he mentioned a figure. I said, oh, I think it's a bit high on the high side, that is. <laughs> See? So I said to him, uh, I wouldn't go more than £2,000. Right. He said, OK, I'll take it. And I've had it ever since, and that was in 1988. Right, so quite a decent time ago. Quite a long time ago. Well, let, let's have a closer look at it. OK. Uh, as I said, on the top, we've got the portrait of Charles I, and underneath we have his wife, Henrietta Maria. What I particularly like about this box is these fantastic, fanciful, almost demonic figures around the side here. Absolutely beautifully pierced and engraved. But we should actually say what it is. And you know what it is, I think. Well, I, I understand when I bought it, I inquired what it was. And I was told that it was gaming discs. Absolutely Used right. by these awful gentry <laughs> many, many, many years ago. They did not even eat, drink and womanise. Well, there we are. 
<laughs> Nothing could be said, is there? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I it, it, it is a counterbox. You're absolutely right. And I think if we take the lid off, we'll see inside these fantastic counters, each one beautifully engraved with different kings and queens that's right. of, of England. Now, there's a maker associated with these, and that's a chap called Simon van der Pass. And he died in 1647. Good heavens. So we know that this box, with the portrait of Charles I, has to be before 1647. Good gracious. So I would date it to about 1640. How many counters are in here, do you know? 32, I thought. Well, that's pretty much near the capacity number of counters you can get in one of these boxes. And over the years, a few of these have come up at auction. And not that many of them have as many as 32 counters, because each one of these is a little piece of art in its own right. Yes. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic detail. You know, 32 little gems all add up to a reasonable sum. Do they? Yeah. I waited you to tell me what that sum is. <laughs> well, I can tell you it's more than two thousand pounds. It is. Yeah. It's now six to eight thousand pounds. No. Golly, I need a bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a gamble that paid off, wasn't it? And we've had our own gamble today with the weather. Unfortunately, the rain has mostly held off, which is just as well because some four thousand people have come to see us here today at Nymers. So thank you to all of them, to all of you and to all of you for watching. From the Antiques Roadshow, bye-bye.